Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming. We have everything worked out, all this high-tech mystery, right? <laughs> well, OK, it's a real pleasure to welcome today Professor Anand Samet, who is uh, a distinguished professor in University of Maryland, right, in, um, in College Park. And also, he's uh, there now. His early life in really was in Los Angeles. In fact, he got his bachelor degree from UCLA, also a master's degree in uh, UCLA in computer science, right? Oh, actually, sir. Okay, okay. No, a bachelor's degree here at UCLA, yeah. right? And then also a master in operational research. And then he went to Stanford for some reason. He took a computer science master there and also a PhD. And that's got him started, of course, on a very successful career, which involved an incredible number of papers and also uh, three famous books. The latest of which is here, right? Which is very thick. I'm very so too thick for me to, to, to raise, but in fact, it's entitled Multidimensional Metric Data Structures. As one of the specialties, which is, of course, uh, you know, geographical and, uh, and multidimensional data structures, right? Okay, and of course, he has received many awards, uh, including the uh, IEEE Computer Society Wallace McDowell Award. He's a fellow of ACM, IEEE. And also, he recently received the award of, for uh, theory and practice, named after Paris Kanellakis, uh, who was a good friend of ours, passed away, a famous uh, database uh, researcher. And this is, in fact, a, a special event because, with this opportunity, we also honor Dr. Norman Friedman, who is sitting here, who also got his PhD from UCLA, and he went on to cover a number of successful positions in government and in the industry, including a uh, pos key position with Cordura Corporation, Herbalife, and the AZ System. He has been a great contributor to UCLA and uh, to our department, the School of Engineering. In fact, he was a recipient of the UCLA Distinguished Service Award, and also is the donor of the Norman E. Friedman Chair, which I have the privilege of uh, occupying. So please uh, greet both. <laughs> our distinguished speaker and our donor, here, Dr. Freeman, with a big <laughs> hand of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, she gives it to me, but oh. I put this in my pocket. Yeah, that's so cool. <laughs> okay. I don't think this has a clip that works. Oh, I see, I see, it's the bottom. Okay, you can hear me, right? Is that okay? All right, all right. So the top, the title of my talk is "Reading News with Maps by Exploiting Spatial Synonyms," and it turns out that this is on the cover of this commu communication of the ACM this month, and that was the cover that I showed you. And I and there is also a video. I didn't make the video. The We're not going. Can you hear it? And it was good. And the news multiplied. And multiplied. Ah, damn it. Yeah. And Let's. Stupid. Let me. See, I planned everything except for the mic. Let's see. How do. Oh. I can just start this again, right? Yeah. All right. Okay. And we won't go through the whole. In the beginning was the news. Can you hear it? And it was good. And the news multiplied, and multiplied, and multiplied, drowning itself out in a riotous cacophony. So researchers at the University of Maryland developed new standards. Okay, I'll stop this. To cut through the noise and find news that matters to them. Okay, so let's go to the talk. Just to, I was told the introduction is sort of interesting. So we do that. All right, so let me just, Carlos said a few things. I, I was an under, undergrad here with working with uh, another guy named Hanan Potash, not a very common name. And I was working for Jerry Estrin with Robert Ugalis. And then I took a course in data structures from Dick Muntz. And then I became, that's sort of my prime achievements have been in data structures. And we actually worked together on some NSF grants, so I've been here a lot. Um, I went to Stanford. I worked on robotics, 
And I'm one of the authors of a compiler for a language called SAIL, which is in graphics and AI. In 1974, I did an online algorithm for something known as the uniform word problem. I didn't know it was a difficult problem, so I solved it, and although I was told that I shouldn't have. And anyway, I had a paper on it, but then I was left off as an author in a, in a very famous place, so nobody knows that I did this until one woman wrote a paper in a major journal saying that I did this, but my name was left off of the paper. So if you never heard of me for this, I mean, that's life. Um, I did a PhD with Vince Cerf at Stanford on compiler correctness, and nobody paid any attention to me afterwards. And, but it turned out 30 years later, I met Todd Milstein. Where are you, Todd? Is he here? Anyway, he said it would be here. Um, and he had a paper where they got an award, and it was the title of the paper was the title of my PhD thesis. And it's sort of amazing, it's quite similar. And later on, I, I learned that this work was credited to Amir Pnueli, who was a Tory Award winner, and a guy named George Nekula at Berkeley, who got a Grace Murray Hopper Award for it. So I managed to do other things, and there, Recently, there's Lerner, Leroy, Milstein who did this. Um, I did some work that preceded splay trees. And then I really did my work on spatial data structures with the books, which really, you know, that's really been my key work, although the other work has become very famous, although nobody cites me. Yeah. If 15 citations per communication of the ACM article is not a lot, okay? Um, Anyway, recently I've been doing this map query interface and geotagging, which is what I'll talk about today. And what it is is really reading, reading news with maps. And the idea is that you don't really have to know what you're doing. Okay? So the application is really, you ask yourself, do you travel? Do you want to keep up with the latest news in the town you've left, especially since it's your own hometown? or maybe keep up with, with sports scores, things like that. And the answer is really this system called Newsstand that we built where you do a search with a map query interface instead of keywords. Okay, we've all been brainwashed to use keywords. The trouble with keywords is that you've got to know exactly what you're looking for, you don't find it. And the map query interface gives you this notion of the ability to get an approximate answer. What, it's re what you're really doing is using a spatial synonym, okay? Because the act of pointing at a location, you know, whatever, and then moving in and zooming in to get more and more, because you're varying the zoom level, is really getting a spatial synonym, okay? In other words, I'm looking for something in Brentwood, and I find it in Westwood, that's a good answer. Yet, if you use a keyword, Brentwood, you're not gonna find Westwood, okay? Now, that's the point of this power of spatial synonyms. And the example is, I use Brentwood, but suppose you're looking for a rock concert in Harlem, okay? Well, sorry, rock concert in Manhattan. Well, an answer like Harlem or, you know, is good because it's contained in Manhattan. You look at New York City, it's also good because it contains Manhattan. Brooklyn is good because it's close to Manhattan and also it's a sibling. In other words, they're, not, they're both boroughs which are so next to each other. Of, of Manhattan, but it is, it's a borough, isn't it? I mean, you look at a sibling property, it's a borough. Now, if you look at conventional search engines and you know, how do they deal with spatial synonyms? Well, they're used the page rank method and they're good at, at finding documents containing keywords that you're looking for, but you can't easily modify them to handle the spatial proximity query. And the primary utility of these search engines is based on popularity. And what they do is they ensure that web pages in a response are ordered by a measure incorporating their frequency. So really the result is that they give the same result to the users. I call it the democratization of search. The only problem with democracy is that, you know, all users are treated equally. It means they both all get the same crap as Okay, there's something about equality there. Now, effectively, what it means is that if nobody ever looked for something before or linked to it, it'll never be found and never presented to the user. OK, 
Okay? In the case of civil synonyms, if you don't have links to pages on account of being equivalent but for the use of the same words, then the similarity will never be found by the search engine as the crawler will never be able to find the, the similar pages when it builds the index of the web pages. So what we want to do is to take advantage of spatial synonyms. Well, in order to do that, we have to look at the location specification process. And basically, you can use an explicit method which uses geometry, like latitude. It's true. <laughs> Think about what I said, you know? It just loosened for a minute. All right. So. OK, see, I'm full of these crappy jokes. I shouldn't say that. Um, was my joke online? I hope not. All right, somebody should edit it. All right. Tell it again. Huh? Tell it again, right? What did Johnny Carson say you want to have on his epitaph? I'll be right back. OK? Anyway, so it's easier to communicate these textual repre uh, represent specifications what is nice about them is that they behave like polymorphic types. In other words, one size fits all. And the beauty is if I give you the, word, the, the words Los Angeles, in one application it's used as a point. Another one, it could be represent the area is important. So this way you just say Los Angeles, you don't have to worry about you know, what, the geometric, you know, what geometric specification do. It'll be done automatically. Um, it also supports the use of spatial synonyms. Of course, there's no free lunch. The drawback is ambiguity. For example, you look at London, does it reference a person or a location? This is the problem of toponym recognition. Toponym is the word that means location. Or if London is a location, which of many is it? Okay, this is known as toponym resolution. Now, what I've done here is give you examples from a sequence of AT&T ads. I encountered these on the airplane. In other words, there's a magazine called Travel and Leisure, and they're sort of promoting that AT&T is clever at understanding where you are. Okay? In other words, when you do a query, so here, you know, for example, emailing in London is like emailing in London. Okay? The idea here is in Kentucky. Okay? One is in Kentucky, and one of them is you know, the real London. Okay? Here, in other words, you know, checking scores in Dublin is like checking scores in Dublin. Here, in Ireland, they're playing, you know, what are they, you know, rugby, okay? And in, in Dublin, California, or Dublin, Ohio, they're playing football, okay? Another one is, look at checking, you know, interpreting weather temperature as a measurement unit, okay? So getting the weather, this is Mexico in, you know, obviously the Mexico we know, and this is Mexico and New York. There is a place called Mexico. Okay? Here, suppose you want local food. Well, there's local food in Texas, China, and this is chi the real China. Okay? But again, so it says finding restaurants in China is like finding restaurants in China. These ads, I'm trying to get permission from AT&T to use them. Okay? Boy, they are, you know, it's hard to get them to answer. But the photographer gave me these, but his captions are a little off because they were assuming you know that there's several Chinas. The real ads would say New York, you know, just they don't assume you're that clever. Neither do I, you know. Now here's another example of an ad, of an article. 
there are 33 different Plymouths, okay? You know, it gives you how far Plymouth is, okay? Uh, another, this example is, I show you these things just to try to show you the complexity of the problem and also that it really arises in real life, okay? These are ambiguous locations in the USA. In other words, they're names of places that aren't what you would associate with. Think about Moscow, Idaho. There's a Moscow, Pennsylvania, okay? There's a Moscow, Tennessee. And our system, interestingly enough, when it looks at Moscow and it gets to Pennsylvania right, and in, I checked all the articles, none of them had the word Pennsylvania, yet we were able to figure it out because of the way, what, the way we do things is we use sort of an adaptive search method where we have a window, and the window is how many words ahead and, and, for, and, and behind you look at. Of course, the bigger the window, the more time it takes. And some of this stuff uses machine learning and other things. But the, the thing about the window, it gives you, you know, so there, how did we get Moscow, you know, Pennsylvania? Well, it turns out the newspaper is called Moscow something, or they're mentioning Scantron. They all mention Scranton. Well, there aren't many Scrantons. So what you're doing is sort of taking clues and putting them together. I, I'm not going to talk much about geotagging and things like that because that's a whole topic, but if you ask me what is, you know, one of the key intellectual challenges here is really understanding location. Now, you can say, oh, this is just a small problem of NLP. There's, you know, nat natural language problem. It's true. I'm not doing it all. But what is interesting he here is that what I did was I took words that are location. I do the same for diseases. I do, you know, so for a disease you can have an ontology which now, and one of the things we have here is I can show you the world in mentions of diseases, mentions of people. One of the neat applications we have is brand remediation. In other words, I have a dictionary of names of companies. I can give you where the companies are mentioned. If you think about it, companies pay a lot of money to see who talks about them. Not that they're looking for good things, they're looking for bad things. So, okay? And uh, one more minute, Mick. So we can do that as well. And if you think about it a little bit more, universities, everybody used to subscribe what are called clipping services. There are people who sit there and read newspapers. Now, what this, uh, this system that we did here, I have a really good friend, unfortunately passed away, but I met him at the gym. It's amazing who you meet at the gym, okay? In, in a sense, he turned out to be the former U.S. ambassador to Saudi Arabia and Jordan, and he was taking classes at Mary Retired in music, and we were talking always about politics, and I showed him this system. He loved it. And you know what it said? What will all our embassy people do? That's all they do is they sit there and read newspapers. And we tried to get the State Department interested in this. Len asked me about And what happens is, in all these organizations, not invented here. You heard of NIH. And, but my friend was really high up. He's the secretary of American diplomacy, number three of retired diplomats. And we got another guy interested, I forgot his name, but he used to be the ambassador of Israel and other places, uh, Salvador and everything. And so they got the, somebody in charge there, and he didn't want to look at it. But eventually, he, he they was forced by upper management to come to look at us. He came, after he says, oh, I got to go to another meeting, and left. And he didn't look at anything. So you asked me, you know, Len, you know, you can't, okay? You know, how do you get people to look at it? It's just like, t you know, if you're, you're, you're a poor professor, you're not supposed to talk to your dean, okay? Because there's a chain of command, okay? Well, there's a chain of command. If you can't get to the low-level guy, the top guy will never see it because they don't want to, they, they can't be bothered, you know, they assign, delegate. Okay, Mickey. Exactly, right. So, so I'm saying, two or more. right, two or more. But the idea is that these are all names that you associate with other places. Yeah. You see Moscow, you don't think of Moscow, Idaho, unless you live there. My but eyes aren't good enough to distinguish the names. In the I know, I'm sorry. And the trouble that with my is, viewer here is, is I, I, I should be able to magnify here. And these PDF things, I can do that. Let me see. If, uh, no, no, don't, don't I don't want to, okay, I've been trying, but. 
Okay. But the, the point I want to make is this same thing happened to me. When, at, when I got this Canalacus Award, I have a friend who always comes to my courses. Bill Gooden, Bill, where are you? Jim, Bill Gooden, he was, he was here. Oh, okay, anyway, I'm not taking role, but the point is that I done course, well, I did for Len, I did course for you also, your company too. And this guy comes to all my, has been to all of them, became friends, so afterwards I went to lunch with him and a couple of his friends came to it and they said, I, I, where are you from? He said, oh, we're from Dublin. And I said, oh, I was on sabbatical in Dublin. No, no, we're Dublin Bay Area. But you see, they speak to me. They didn't even think that I wouldn't, you know, it was natural. So that's the point. So our goal is to change the news reading paradigm. And we want to be able to, re to use a map to read news for all media. That means text, photos, tweets, videos. And what you want to do is choose a place of interest and find topics or articles relevant to it. Now these topics and articles are determined by location and, le and the level of zoom. And there's no really predetermined boundaries on the sources of the articles. So application I mentioned, monitoring hotspots, who would be interested, investors, uh, hedge fund managers, national security, disease monitoring. And what you're getting is really one-stop shopping for spatially oriented news reading. So one of the things we can do is summarize the news. What are the, you know, wh what are the top stories happening? Explore the news, like what's happening in Darfur. Maybe discover patterns. How are the Olympics in Darfur related? An example. So the overall goal is really to mac make the map as the medium for presenting all spatially referenced information. Now here we're doing it for news. Actually, this whole project started with a, a friend of mine from HUD, Housing Urban Development, and he'd always come to my presentations on spatial browsers, which is what I did bef a lot before, and we sort of said, hey, we should find something to work together on, and I came up with this idea, and he had some money, and you know, they gave us a little bit of money, and we did it for HUD documents, okay? The idea is that they have a lot of documents, and how do you access them by location or with a map? And this was really designed for something behind the firewall. Okay? In other words, for an organization to use to organize their documents. And what you know, happened was we did it. I mean, I, I did it. And then Jim Gray of Microsoft would, was interested in, would fund people if you gave them a, a unique idea. And basically, you had to write everything in 250 words or less. And I got, you know, and I did, and I said, well, who cares about HUD? I said, uh, by a whim, I said, let's try news. And he liked it. And so they gave us some funds, and, and we did it. And, I mean, they're just very partial, tiny, you know. And I gave a demo, you know, at Microsoft, and people liked it. And they said, oh, we'll get it done, you know, we'll finish it off in two months. Well, it's not a two-month project. And of course, it's like everything, if you don't do it in X time, you, you get moved to another project. And it was never done, but I'm just giving you an idea of how, you know, what was the motivation for doing it, okay? So, you know, how do you map the news? Well, we cluster the articles on the same topic, what's known as using TFIDF. If you know what that means, if you don't, it says t term frequency, inverse document frequency. What happens is people take collections of documents called corpuses. And unfortunately, I think corpuses are like corpses, okay? And what happens is it freezes the language, okay? And so they'll take like 500, you know, a bunch of articles, and they look at the words, and they, they have sort of frequency counts. So that determines, you know, approximately how often does this word occur. So obviously T-H-E is a lot, okay? This is not very significant. Now, IDF, inverse document frequency, means that, hey, this word does not occur often, but it occurs often in this thing. That makes it an important word. So you cluster based on these feature vectors. And this, again, comes close to my research you know, in my books because I'm looking at indexing of high dimensional data. And what these are, you basically take every word as a feature. So an article with 1,000 words is a 1,000 dimensional feature vector. And so it's sort of a natural thing for us to work on with similarity searching and things like that. So what, you know, what we do is we associate these clusters, which are similar feature vectors, 
and with the mentioned locations, which we extract. And so the point is that the same cluster can be associated with many locations. Okay? Now, as you zoom in, of course, the cluster populations will be smaller as there are fewer articles referred to the viewing window. Now, the, small, the more you zoom in, the more important location is. Okay? And so it plays a larger role in the clustering algorithm. And geotagging errors in that case are less likely to be filtered out because you have a smaller sample. Okay? Now, then we have this concept of cluster rank versus cluster spread. Now, when you look at the map, you don't want to see all the topic, all the stories in one area. Okay? So, you, you know, if you have areas with no articles, implying that less important articles are displayed with some regions than others, and some important articles are not sp displayed at all unless you zoom in. In other words, just because you have a map, it doesn't mean that the data obey, you know, that you got data in every location or important data. So, basically, you sort of dub subdivide the map into some, you know, like a grid, and for each grid cell, you give what the most important one in there, even though they're not most important with respect to the whole world. This way you get a little, what I call a cluster spread, and as you zoom in and pan, you want to make sure, this is an important thing, what I call consistency, is that once an article has been displayed, it persists until its location is no longer in the viewing window. I call this zoom consistency. And one of the things this work has led me to do is I've been looking at mapping APIs on smartphones. And I have a whole paper on this looking at them. And how did I get into this? Well, again, it's my ambassador friend, okay? It's an interesting story. I got him in, you know, he got, he liked so much the newsstand. And I told him, I have an iPod Touch, why don't you get one? So he bought an iPod Touch. And we installed it. And he was, you know, looking at it all the time. And you know, one day he came into to my office, to, you know, because he had a problem. What did he do? You know, when I, I, iOS six came out, you know, they replaced the mapping API of Google with with Apple's, and it was a disaster. Okay, everybody talked about it, and to me, the disaster, you know, the, the disaster they talked about was that the Errors, okay? In other words, this place, you know, the Washington Monument was somewhere else. The, you know, let's say the, the train station in Finland is elsewhere. I have a whole talk on this, but I, I don't want to give this talk now because we don't have time, but if you're interested, you can contact me. Um, anyway, so I, wa I wasn't finding these errors. I was finding errors like, you know, the zooming. You know, you zoom in, it's there. You zoom in further, it's not. You zoom in again, it's more. And I came up with these factors called zoom consistency, sibling consistency, various things. And I evaluated all the different platforms. And it turned out that the best mapping was the original Apple one, the original from Google. And when you went to iOS 6, there, you know, there were a lot of problems. They didn't fix them in iOS 7 or iOS 8. It's amazing because I wrote the paper in 2012 and I thought, well, they'll fix it. You know, I published it in a, in a workshop and I forgot about it. And last year, I don't know, I looked at it again, and they, in iOS 7, all the errors were there, even more, okay? Also, they have pan consistency, panning. As you pan, if you see the Netherlands and you pan, and the Netherlands is still visible, it should be there, it shouldn't disappear. But it does that on Apple, okay? And for example, then I found that Google Android, it puts Maryland in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, okay? Of course, the problem is I captured all of these. I got real images, but if you try it today, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't work like that anymore. So what happens is they're constantly changing things, but not necessarily. Apple didn't fix them, and so now I submitted the paper again. But it, I tried it for like 12 different platforms. It's a ton of work, you know, and my I never thought it would work. I mean, it would stick around. So I got a little bit distracted here, but I wanted you to understand that there. Consistency in these things is very important, and it's not really paid attention to. But this is sort of because, you know, it's a monopoly industry. How many people are doing these things? People are conditioned. What I wrote in my paper was that maps on smartphones, what they are is we're, we're used to using atlases, okay? And 
We also, maps used to be produced for many people, you know, a large audience. Now they're done custom. Just whenever you want one, you get one. But people used to wait for maps to be printed or things like that. So when they waited, they really appreciated whatever it was and they didn't really complain. You know, when, when, they, when they got these online maps, they thought, oh, it's great. How who wants to, com you know, compared to waiting for paper, this is great. But what Apple's, you know, one, when they had all these errors, it's like you go, you, you go to the precipice. There's a certain point where, you know, it's like a direct delt, you know, or something. There's a point where, you know, the, the break, you know, your tolerance is over. And, you know, that's when people started complaining. Before, they never complained. Now, another thing about mapping is zooming in and panning are expensive, okay? Because you, you gotta load new map tiles and things like that. So, a as you're navigating with your finger, you keep on loading things, okay? You don't know when it stops. So, we put in a couple of features called home. Home meaning you, you put an address in and if you click on it, you get just like where you're coming from. You want something automatic or local, takes you to where you are or world gives you the world. The idea is to sort of reduce the amount of time you're sending map data needlessly. And that's, you know, something we're working on is caching, basically trying to figure out from the user where he's been, where they're going, to, you know, to have some of the data around. When do I have to finish by? Can you tell me when do I have to? Okay, all right, okay, I just don't want to run over. Okay, so existing news readers, you know, the popular news aggregators like Google News, Yahoo, and Microsoft Bing News, they have very rudimentary understanding of the implicit geographic content of news articles. Usually it's based on the address of the publisher or a newspaper. And usually the presentation format is linear. You get one followed by the other. Um, or, you know, and if you look at Google News Reader, it classifies articles by topic. Local news is often just by zip code or city or state of population. So, you know, you might say articles mentioning College Park, Maryland, or, you know, there'll be, they'll give you a limited number of articles on that thing. Um, it seems to often be based on the host of the articles. In other words, Los Angeles, Los Angeles Times will be Los Angeles or things like that. And example like zip code 20742 where I live, are those mentioning College Park, Maryland, or University of Maryland. So it goes based on those things when it gives you by location. It really has no story, no notion of story importance in the grand scheme. And of course, international versions use international sources. So I'm showing our system that uses all these things, are called, it's called Newsstand, you know, you have to have some acronym, so spatial textual aggregation of news and display. How's that? You know, you gotta be, you know, it's not bad, you know, for stand. You got a better one. Anyway, we crawl the web, you know, and we index 10,000 news sources. So you get about 50,000 news articles per day. We aggregate by content and location. We mentioned that we rank the clusters by importance. It's based on number of articles in the cluster, number of unique news sources, also the events rate of propagation to other newspapers. In other words, how fast is it getting other places? If other places pick it up, that means it's more important. Um, now, other options that are exist, you can, do, you can categorize things by business, general, entertainment, so on. We also have image and video galleries, which means images from the same place, and you can map by disease, brands, and it also works for Twitter. So here's an example of the user interface on the web version, and you can see here, um, you have options, you can, you can pick a language. We work in all languages, it uses Google Translator and Microsoft Translate, so you can actually get all, you know, any language, and it'll cluster them. You can pick by country, so you can see what countries, you know, what newspapers certain countries are talking about. The sources, you can pick them, there are layers for different diseases, brands I mentioned. Um, here's the, you know, so what happens is that when you go to location, it gives you a snippet here about it, and this mini-map is the neat idea here. The mini-map, we're in Moscow here, so it shows you in the yellow, the, yeah, the orange balls here, they tell you 
where this topic, where other locations where this topic is happening. Because the point is, you could be zoomed in, you can't see the whole world. So this gives you a very nice summary. The blue balls tell you where, are, where do we have stories with other Moscows, okay? In other words, I have a geotagger, and the geotagger looks at every article and looks for words that are location. Now, it might miss some. If it does, too bad. But I'm assuming, suppose it doesn't miss any. But once it gets them all, it has to decide which one is it. Is it Russia, Idaho, Tennessee, and all that? So what I've done here is the orange balls are Russia. The blue balls are other locations which I have said have some articles with them. So what's the beauty here? I can, it's like page rank. In other words, I can go to the blue balls and look at each one and decide, are you right or wrong? It's just like what you do in a Google search. When you do a search in Google, it gives you a ton of answers. It ranks them, but it doesn't mean they're in your order of importance. Well, I'm saying by doing this, I'm not missing any. So if you look, if you've done any information retrieval, you measure the process by precision and recall. Okay, precision means how, that how many false positives you have, and recall means you know, how many false negatives, okay? So this way, by using the minimap, I don't have any false negatives because the human is getting them all. So you're getting 100% recall. And people look at me like I'm nuts, okay? I submitted a paper, double-blind reviewing, and they rejected it because they thought I was a crackpot because how can you get 100% recall? Actually, they didn't dismiss it so much. They gave me three ratings. Two, borderline, and they said minimap's a nice idea. One was weak except, anyway, they rejected me. And I said, I wrote a long complaint. And they said, oh, okay, they didn't want to answer me. But I'm saying that when you tell people you're doing 100% recall, they think you're nuts, okay, because you can't do that, okay? But I changed the title to be effective, you know what I mean? But, you know, one of the things you, you have to learn in research, and everybody, this looks like a research class, right? The 201, or what is, is it, or, anyway, the hardest thing to do in research is not to solve a problem. There are a million problem solvers in the world, but very few problem posers, okay? The hard thing is to pose a problem, not to solve it, because if you're first at posing, you could give any solution that works and you'll be famous, okay? Because you're first, whereas if other people have worked on it, you gotta do a lot, so it's much easier to be a poser than a solver, even though it's, you know, there's a zillion solvers, but very few posers. So here, I gave you the same idea with this top uh, resolution and all that. You're looking at something, you may not have an answer, but you get an approximate. And basically, I built my whole career on doing things you weren't supposed to do. In other words, solving problems that were unsolvable, or it, because they weren't really unsolvable, it's just that they're unsolvable if you're a mathematician, which means you want the most general problem. I want the most specific one. I have a problem, I want to solve it. I don't want to show that you can't do it, okay? And a lot of focus of theoretical work is to show that you can't do something. Rather, you know, it's much easier to say you can't do, not easy, but at least you know what your goal is, you know? So that's the thing here. I wanted to show this mini-map, and it's really, you know, I think a pretty nice idea. Now, the map mode is basically a query that says, Given a location, tell me what's happening. The, there are really two types of queries. And these queries are the same in computer graphics and computer vision. What and where. Given a location, what's happening? Where says given something, where is it happening? So top stories mode right here works on given, you know, given a topic, where is it happening? And we're ranking the topics here by importance. So if I click here, it shows me on the map where, what locations this is happening in. This is known really as spatial data mining, okay? So spatial data mining is nothing but this, and actually we wrote the first paper on spatial data mining. We just didn't know it was spatial data mining, and it appeared in pods, but we called it feature-based queries. So, you know, what can you do? Um, this is the image gallery I mentioned. This is ISIS. And you can see these are, and if you click here, you can get the story. I'll show you another example soon. These are video galleries, okay? These are all pictures from videos about ISIS. And you see right here, it'll give you the source and the topic, you know, extracted. It's a pretty nice way to look at. You click and you get the video. 
This is a disease tracking application. Remember I said before, I have a disease layer. So what's happening here is I find the diseases that are mentioned in articles and the locations and I associate it with them. So this is a way to do this and the minimap right here, you see it's associated with Valencia. Well, so the orange is basically all the diseases that are, in this, that are mentioned in Valencia. But you see you get this very compact way and if you click on them you get the article, okay? And so this, and the same thing here is a little different. This is running the system in time mode. And what we did here is Ebola, tracking Ebola. And this is like a heat map. It shows over time how things spread. So this, you know, this is another, that's a new thing. Here's the brand remediation. You mentioned, you know, which, where are these companies mentioned, okay? So here's FedEx somewhere, Verizon. This is in the U.S. various places that mention certain companies. People on the map. So here I have, you know, names of people, and you know they're mentioned here. The, I'm going to show you a demo as well on on the smartphone. These things, for some reason, are not working on the iPhone. Okay, and what happens is there's nothing wrong with my system because you see it. You, I output it just this morning, but what happens is they change XML protocols constantly, and if you're not looking at it, they don't tell you they do that. So then things don't work. This is one of the real pains about working with mobile apps is that, you know, things change, okay? These are just little snapshots. This is what the Apple user interface looks like. This is the Android and this is the Windows phone, you know, just again to point out. If you're wondering how the system is built, this is sort of a, an, an overview of the architecture and so this is sort of the system here. The first thing, and I'll do it here, there's an RSS grabber. What it does is it pulls RSS feeds and retrieves URLs to news articles, okay? Then there's a downloader which actually downloads these articles and you'll see on, you can see the color coding here so you can see where it is in the process. Then there's also a cleaner. What's the cleaner do? It extracts article content from source HTML. This is not an easy process. Why? Because there could be ads, there could be all kinds of things. You just want the, the news articles. And one of the things is like you want to identify photos, okay? Now some photos are ads and some are not. So what you do is you look at the caption. If it's a photo, there'll be some text there. And what we try to do is see if the text of the caption clusters with the text of the article. If it does, then it probably has something to do with it. So you see, it's, that, that's a whole, you know, we're writing a paper on this. Now the clusterer, you know, groups all articles together about the same story. You see here it's sort of, you know, you have this here. Then you have a topic classifier which assigns general topics to articles. We're not the greatest here. It's just, a, you know, it's just something to show you. I wouldn't claim it as real novelty. The geotagger, that's sort of a nice, aspect of the work. This is the one that finds the toponyms and assigns lat long values to, to them. There's also, we have a people disease finder, finds names of people diseases. Media extractor extracts captioned images and videos, okay? And then there's a web interface that accesses the data to retrieve the data for display. Now, as I said, the map query interface requires the geotagger, and we mentioned this is what converts, you know, the text into words. Um, and one thing about geotagging is that you're, you know, there are really four steps to it. One is identifying or recognizing. Another one is classifying. In other words, is Michigan a state or a lake? Another you know, type feature. Disambiguating or resolving, you know, which Moscow is it? And your localizing is really converting to the geocoding or text or GPS coordinates. Now, I'm not going to get that much into geotagging. I just want to give you the highlights so you can, you can counter somebody who says, oh, this has all been done before. Okay? And here's an example. Now, suppose I look at the context of a textual reference. All right? Now, we have two types here. One is in queries, and one is, you know, in the case of queries, you can, you can, if I tell you Alexandria, you can figure it out by looking at prior queries and, and your location, okay? And, and so 
for example, if I say Alexandria and I'm in College Park, Maryland, most likely it's going to be Alexandria, Virginia. Okay? And here I show you what, you know, which ones they get. Okay? Apple iOS 5 and Maps by Google, it gives you here. And you can see what, what is happening here. And basically, the only Apple iOS 6 and iOS 7 are the only ones they put Alexandria in Egypt. The rest put it in, you know, in Virginia. Okay? So you see they're using context. There's nothing wrong here with either. I'm just showing you. But why did I give you this? Because the second type is in the underlying data that's being queried. Here you have no history. Okay? In other words, you just what you want to do is geotag the data. You got no data except your context. Okay? Now why did I bring this example? Because I showed the newsstand system that, I, that I'm talking about to a I was at Google I.O. and I showed it to a guy from the Manchester Guard from the Guardian. The Guardian newspaper is very famous. That's where Snowden leaked all his documents. And they weren't that, he wasn't really interested. In a sense, they said, well, we do it by hand, and they're perfectly happy doing it by hand. I don't think that's a reasonable solution, but as I was showing it to him, there's another guy standing and says, oh, Google does this. Google does this. This is nothing. You know. And I was sort of taken aback. This is one of the things, whenever you're talking to people, you don't always know how to answer. Okay? You know it's not true, but, and later I realized, you know, and I sort of realized, they do do it. Okay? What they can do is on the queries, but not on the data, because, in fact, Google has this, this thing called, I forgot, Knowledge, Knowledge Vault or some, I forget the name. But, uh, no, uh, it's called, yeah, I forgot the name, graph. but, huh? Graph. Graph. Yeah, knowledge graph, that's it, knowledge graph. And that's true, because they use the prior in information about the queries. But if you don't have that, you can't do that. So what I'm saying is, in our case, we're really geotagging the actual data more than the queries. So I'm just pointing out that, you know, how you react to these type of comments. Now, I'm not going to get into these because I want to accept to point out that one of the things we do, we use something called a lo local lexicon. You asked me before, no you didn't ask, but I said that in the case of Moscow and Pennsylvania, we got it. Why? Because we, we know, you know, in other, what you say is an, a local newspaper assumes the readers are from that area, so ambiguities are resolved in that way. So for example, you read the New York Times, New York Times says Dublin. They don't have to say Ireland. Everybody knows that when you read the New York Times, Dublin is Ireland. Whereas if you read a newspaper in Columbus, Ohio, they say Dublin. They mean Dublin, Ohio. So here I showed you for Columbus, Ohio, look at all the names in the neighborhood. Baltimore. I'm just saying, these are all little towns there. So I'm saying it's real. Okay. So this local lexicon is one of the reasons we do well. Okay, because we use this extra information. Here is a simple, just an example of some text. And what you see here, I pointed out all the names that are candidates for location. Okay? And there are potential mistakes. I got, you know, the green are potential mistakes. And then, you know, another example here is how do we resolve them? We look for entity tables, keywords like representative, proper noun phrases. And then there's something called name entity recognition. So here's still a final ex the final version of it. Then if you see something, Lamar County, it's really the county of Lamar. You know, if you see active verbs, if the verb is an active verb, you know, after the, the candidate, then it's going to be a person. It's not going to be a location. A location doesn't walk. Do you see? So this is sort of the NLP type things here. Noun adjuncts, Houston attorney, um, find a, you know, these are the final local entities. Okay? Now let's show the system. Okay? And let's see. Now comes the big challenge. I'm going to show you running on the app. Okay? And here, no, you know, I, you know, at worst I will then go to the web version for a minute. Okay? How do you get this out? These are really yeah. 
I should have really stuck to the other thing. Do um, you see? Where's the, oh. Didn't I have a, oh, yeah. I forgot that I'm going from this. Just remind me to take my cable back, okay? All right, you see this? Please. Yeah, hey. Okay, so I hope I have Wi-Fi here. Do, do I have it? Let's hit world. It's not good. What happened to my Wi-Fi? Oh, it's slow. Wow. Okay, let's go world here. All right. You see that little circle there? That means our Wi-Fi is slow. Anyway, so I zoom in here, and let's go. I go to Syria, okay? And let's see. So I click on this article here, and that's a representative article on Syria. Let's hope it comes. Ah, oh, it works. It works. So you see Yahoo News? You can actually read it. This is your smartphone. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's doable. Okay. When I first started, everything was microscopic. So one of the big things is doing the user interface to respect this two by four inch, you know, platform. It's quite a challenge. Okay. And so, and, and here you can actually read it. Okay. So now, in this cluster on ISIS, there are six, you know, almost seven thousand documents. I shouldn't click on here, but I did. This is real time. Okay. Here's you know, a, you know, artic a sample from each article. Now, associated with these articles are images. So what we're doing is image retrieval based on the text associated with it. So similar images, not based on image content. In other words, not by image features like histograms and all that. So what I'm doing now is fetching the images, okay? And there's seven, you know, a lot of them here. And now some could be duplicates. So I mark duplicates. I can remove them. Now something else I can do, I can view them here. Let me enlarge. See what I'm doing now? Pretty neat. See, you're going through all the images. These are in ISIS, OK? As you click here, it gives you the article. Not bad. It's working, even with this slow. All right, so we go here. Let's go back. OK, let's. Oh, what did I do here? Oh, did a stupid thing. OK, let's go back. I sometimes, it's my fault because I'm not doing things properly. Let's go to Syria again. Weren't we at Syria before? Oh, this is Israel. Yeah, I think this is, this is Syria. Let's try. Um, okay, so we're going back to where we came from. Let's try videos. I'm not sure if they'll, it, they'll it'll, oh, what do you know? All right, so let's try this. This is less than one minute ago. ISIS advance brings fear to Baghdad. Wow, okay. Let's play it. Sometimes they're YouTube, they're, you hear it? Cleaning and gutting carp for his customers in Baghdad's Jadria neighborhood. He wonders you hear it? why, after more than two months of U.S. This is live, like one minute ago. ISIS is on the outskirts huh? of his home. In your hand, wherever you go. Huh? Yeah, or whatever, yeah, all right. Anyway, I'm sorry I look enthusiastic, but I think it's. You see, when I was a kid, I love newspapers. I started reading newspapers when I was six. As soon as I learned how to read, and I, I remember I used to have a list of every newspaper that I read about, okay? And I had a little notebook where I wrote down, you know, it's amazing that you sometimes come back to what you started, you know. And, you know, I, I was a stamp collector too, but I haven't gotten back to that yet. All right. Um, so we saw this here. Now, what I mentioned before, you can pick the sources. Okay, and here, these are some newspapers we get. So here, for example, The Guardian, you know, where Snowden was. So what I'm doing now is I'm reading The Guardian with a map, okay? So 
every, if I go somewhere, the representative article of the cluster, oh, come on, okay, will be from the Guardian. You see here the Guardian? So you're reading the Guardian with a map. Okay, now what else can I do? Let's go to sources again. And uh, let's turn off the Guardian because I always forget to do this and then things don't work. Here, I can tell you I want newspapers in a certain country. So what you're doing now is you're getting a perspective from a certain you know, opinion, okay? It's like you read about the Middle East from English newspapers. Everything is you know, very biased in a certain way, whatever you think, but there is a you know, certain thing. Now, let's pick languages, okay? Let's pick Hebrew, all right? What language? I, I pick Hebrew, but all right, if you don't know Hebrew, too bad. Um, <laughs> what can I do? All right, so here, oh, it takes a bit for, hmm. Just a minute, I think, oh, I know what happened. I did a stupid thing as usual. What do you think I did? I forgot to turn English off. I do this all the time. Okay, now, and then I think that things are not working. You see, oh, you saw the Hebrew letters? Okay. The point is that, I'll, all right, here, okay. Now, you see the Hebrew letters here. You don't know Hebrew, so you hit T, translates to English, okay? You click on here, and you'll get the article in Hebrew. You don't know Hebrew, it'll, you know, it'll translate. Okay, you see here, this is an ad, unfortunately. Let's see if it translates the ad. That'd be interesting, I don't, that's probably was not a good idea. Oh yeah, it did, you see? It's pretty good. Um, the translation here is done by Google Translate, um, so it's not doing everything, but because I get like a million characters per day, I have Microsoft Translator also available where they give me 60 million, but it's for one year, and I don't want to start it until I need it. You know, you know the, that's a lot. With 60 million, you can translate every article each day that appears all over the world, which is quite an achievement, okay? But there's really, okay, let's turn off the Hebrew here. And what else? Oh, this, this thing doesn't work, okay? Now I'm gonna try anyway. What I mean is the diseases I showed you before, there, again, there's something in the M XML call here, but you see it worked here. Do you see, you saw the names cancer, and there's something that takes them away. But you see, they get placed, and then you see the word cancer. Oh, here it is working. Ebola, okay? So we pick, oh, it crashed. But see, I don't have, oh, let's see what happened here. No, the, I have to get back to settings, let's say disease again. This really works, okay? If you'd want to try this, you go to newsstand.umeax.umd.edu and it'll work, and it'll work nicely on an iPad, okay? in a sense that the web version works fine on the a iPad, but on the iPhone, it's a mobile version, that's a web version, it's not the app, it's still not everything has been made to work, okay? But the iPad, it works in web mode, not in, in app version. So here, let's, uh, we ha we, I thought we were doing the diseases, setting, oh yeah, they were there, shoot. You see them here? Let's try Ebola again. Let's hope it doesn't crash. Mali, okay, oh. All right, but you got the idea there. And so I think, yeah, oh, let's try one more thing. Um, I showed you the top stories mode, okay. Here's a neat thing. Do you see how I hold, do you see the plus and minus there? Okay, the user interface here, you change hand, it changes to be what hand you're holding in. I filed a patent on this. But you could, you know, so the whole idea here is to do everything with a one-handed interface. So you see, I don't, I could be like, you know, my other hand, I don't have to do this to pinch, because I can do everything with a thumb, and I can do something else with my hand. And I didn't realize this, okay? And I showed this to another friend, and he said, because I do everything in my left hand, he says, 
Oh, were you left-handed? My parent, I was left-handed. My parents forced me. You're lucky. They didn't force you to change. No, I use it because it's my weak hand. Do you see what I'm saying? So you let by using interface here, and then I then I then I realize I, I have an idea here, namely the one-handed interface, namely whether you do it with a strong hand or weak hand. So I'm saying there are many many things here which are sort of you know interesting from an application. And so, you know, that, that's really what we're, oh, I wanted to show you the top stories. Okay, remember I mentioned top stories like a feature-based query. And if you spin it like this, you see it gets blue and then it stops. That's another invention, okay? In other words, when you hover, okay, the problem, there's no hovering with a touch interface. Okay, why? Because you're touching, how can you hover? So I call it the wheel of fortune user interface. You give it a spin, which is just like a hover. When it stops, it generates a click. That's a hover with a touch interface. Again, not quite, but I told you I always st stretch the truth, you know? <laughs> I mean, anyway, I guess that's, oh, um, that's just one more since you, okay, let me, let's go to map mode. Oh, just a minute. You see, there's different systems here. Now it's on newsstand. Now it's on Twitter stand. Okay, what is Twitter stand? Um, that's our system. Oh, damn it. Okay, Twitter stand does the same thing for news it does for tweets. Now, the interesting thing about tweets is that tweets are only 140 characters. And there's no location there. Come on, you know, when you tweet, I'm going home or something like that. Or, but a lot of people tweet URLs to newspaper articles and other things. So what we do is we follow the URL and cluster with the existing news and then we derive a location. So what we do is we tell you where people are tweeting from. No, sorry, where people are tweeting about, not where they're tweeting from. All the work that you see on geolocation for tweets is based on where people are tweeting from because they got GPS cord, you know, on the tweeter. But here you're doing something else and so the same idea for that. And let's see, one more. There's something called photo stand. And what you're doing here is you're capturing all the photos that we have by location, then you're browsing them by topic. So you can do the same for photos. And I guess I'll stop because it's time. I'm sorry I went a little bit over. Thank you. Neil, Neil yeah. No, no, in fact, one of my students, what he was, the problem is these guys, they never finish, okay? They start, so he wanted to do lyrics. The idea is by lyrics, it's similar to what you're doing. The lyrics, so I want, you know, there was a song called Abilene. Anybody heard of Abilene, Abilene, prettiest sound I've ever seen? So here's, you know, how do you find it? You can do that. So the, you can do anything here. It's, you know, I don't mean anything, but. A lot of information, it just, the point is, you don't know you're looking for Abilene, but you're looking somewhere in Kansas. Can you imagine? I don't remember the name of the song, but it was somewhere in Kansas. You zoom in and suddenly it comes up. It's great for older people. They can't remember anything. So it's for the dementia age. And I'm old, you know, so I forget. Any other? Mickey? With Oh, you could, I mean, they have locations. You can do with, it's with yellow pages. You could do it for restaurants. You could do it, you just, all you need is a, a set of locations and names. And what I'm doing is putting a news article with a name, but uh, restaurants are easier. So one of the things you can do here is find mentions of restaurants or other things. It's just really another application. But also you can do it very nicely with the title, um, sources, uh, with the, you know, purposes of various archives. Right, right, and and our gazetteer, right, our gazetteer has the name for the has multiple names for the same thing. I'll give you something really funny. Oh, I didn't. I got to show you this. Yeah, um, this just takes a minute. Uh, while I'm talking, I'll do. I'll say, okay. Um, the uh, in newsstands, something interesting. Okay, 
I used to have a real problem. I put Philadelphia in Jordan. Do you know why? Huh? Anybody know? Do you know what Philadelphia is? It's Amman, Jordan. It's Philadelphia. It's the Greek name. Philadelphia is a Greek word. And the name of Amman was Philadelphia. And we used to do that. Well, we stopped that. Okay, but I'll show you another example. Okay. This is sort of fun, you see? All right, let's see here what I want to... Ah, you see here, Batman? Okay, this is really a funny story. Batman, there's a city of three million in Turkey. It's a big city, okay? And we found Batman, and of course we don't get it right. It's the movie. But my student, when he, when he, the first time he found Batman, there was an article there that the city of Batman is suing Marvel Comics. I swear, I, have, I, I, I kept it. They're suing Marvel Comics for using it with their name without permission. And if you want to see it, write to me and I'll, get, I'll send you the article. It's hilarious, okay? So you see, if you look at my video, what I tell you is, at the end I say, it's sort of a nice way to spend the Sunday afternoon, you know? <laughs> and why, why did I say that? A lot of people in New York they, Sunday is New York Times Day. They get the New York Times, they spend the rest of the afternoon reading it. So now you, don't need, you can just do this. So look at my video, it's sort of, it's sort of fun. All right, any other question? question? Yes, yeah. Uh, how real time is the data, what's the polling frequency? Huh? How real time is the data? Oh, it's completely real time. It's happening right now. Every, I have servers that are constantly reading the web. Do, this is all done, I gave you the architecture, it's a pipeline server. The server is grabbing 10 articles at a time, sending it to another, pro another you know, processor. I have several machines, each one is doing a different task, and there's a pipeline. And in about a minute, it already ingests everything. You saw one minute ago. I gave you some videos, they're one minute ago. So it's pretty real time. Does that answer? Yeah. Any other question? Yes, Mickey? Yeah. The initial search, right? And all the way over to the human interface, which has got nothing to do with geography. Exactly. That's right, so yeah. It's, it's, uh, so my paper captures some of these things. And, you know, there's a paper in Communication ACM, the feature article this month. I'm on the cover. I think I showed it to you, didn't I? It was, huh? It was on the first thing. And, you know, I, if. If I have a couple extra copies, if anybody wants one, that. So, any other questions, Carlo? Well, there's another question there. Go ahead. Sorry, uh, if you don't mind sharing, I'm kind of curious how the right hand versus left hand works. Like, well, okay. <laughs> yeah. It is a acceler it is accelerometer. Okay. You know, it's not yeah. a big is deal. Yeah. Oh no, but you have to figure out how. Yeah. You know, yeah. well, there's a, you know, it's just a, when you hold something in your hand, think about how you're holding it. That's it. I mean, you're not going to hold it in, in an obtuse, in an obscure way. Anyway, but it's a pretty neat idea, no? So, anyway, a lot of neat things come when you, when you play with things. I'm a hacker, okay? I didn't write the code, but I designed the entire user, inter I mean, the interface and that. But it's fun, but it takes a lot of time. And it's frustrating. Okay.